<laughs> hey guys, he's the Let me show you my underboob. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> yes. Hey, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. What an honor. Hey, uh, well, well, I'm so glad you come on. How do you feel, by the way, the, the idea that the end is this close to being in sight? It just, it's got to be weird. You've been doing this 50 years. Yeah. Um, I, you know what? It's exciting and scary all at the same time. I have, I've never done anything else in my life, so I have no idea what the next step is going to be. I'm going to take the first quarter of next year and try to figure it out. I think I would be more scared than excited myself right now, but uh -huh. maybe not in a couple of years. Uh, do you have yeah. a, Do you have a, any idea what you want to do on the last day or a last song you want to play? You don't have to tell us, but have you thought about that? You no, know, I, I haven't thought about that yet. I, but you know what, <laughs> Drew, you got to understand. I am probably the laziest human being on the planet. <laughs> I won't decide that till about 9.30 that morning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't put a lot of forethought in this. I kind of go in swinging and hope one of them, uh, you know, doesn't get caught. Well, hey, it worked out pretty well. It's a long time. And I, I saw on Detroit Radio Buzzboard. Do you ever look at that, by the way? I don't, actually. Don't. I mean, I, I guess I used to, and then I found it to be kind of a cesspool, and it was the <laughs> same it five is. people bitching about everything. Yeah. It's pretty awful. But you know what? They had Jim Johnson retires, and there were, uh, this is right after the announcement, there were like 28 responses already. They were very nice. And I was like, oh, good. why are these people so nice to Jim? They give me shit all the time. <laughs> I hate these people. <laughs> you know what? Th th this is the honeymoon, dude. It's the retirement honeymoon. So... <laughs> A couple of weeks after I'm gone, the whole landscape will change. Um, I Anyway, somebody had a survey from WWCK from May 22nd, 1972. Do you, when you were working what? weekends at Rock 105 in Flint. Yeah. Is that accurate? Yes. It was a brand new station. So here's how it went down. Uh, the summer before that, uh, I was 18. It was my was summer between my freshman and sophomore year at CMU. And I had no idea what radio was all about. I loved it, but I had never seen a station, never thought of it, had no idea how it worked. And I just wandered into every single radio station in Detroit and Windsor and Flint and uh, asked them for a job. I finally got one at uh, a station here in Detroit called WEXL. It was one shift a week. It was 3 p.m. on Sunday afternoon until midnight. Oh, boy. And I played religious tapes and live <laughs> sermons, and we even had... An ensemble, a family group that came in and did gospel music oh. on their acoustic guitars that I had to engineer. Nice. Well, that's you learn how to run the board. Yes. That's well, the that's key. the thing. The guy told me, he said, listen, you're here all alone. You have the whole place to yourself. There's a lot of downtime. He said, if you want to teach yourself the business, have at it. You can play with anything you want to play with. And that's kind of how I learned it a little bit. Well, you got to appreciate people like that because nobody ever gets a chance if they don't get a chance. But yeah, it doesn't work that way anymore, as you know. I know. Anyway, I was going to ask you if you remember what the lineup was at Rock 105 when you were working weekends <laughs> in May of 72. Boy. Mark Addy was there, I think, at the time. Do you see his name did, on the list? Did he go by Mark Adams? Yeah, he probably did. Yes, he, he probably did. But then he became Mark Addy, came down here and worked at W4 and at WRIF. So we were compadres for uh, off and on for a number of years. Yeah, he was, he was doing kind of a mentor. He was doing 10 to 2 at night when uh, we started WRIF. But Mark was on afternoons. Do you remember who the morning guy was? No idea. Bill Gibson. Oh, yeah. Well, he was the program director. Okay. And then another guy named Bill Pearson, I think, was yep. on the air. He was the music director. He was the midday. Robin Stone evenings, Jim Diamond all night. And then you yes. and Marty Natchez on the weekends. Yeah. And that's yeah. what it says. <laughs> and then uh, was on to W4 from there? Um, no. And actually, because uh, I was still in school. So it was back up to play football oh, at CMU. Okay. And I was the program director of the campus station there. Oh, and, cool. Uh, I ended up uh, having three knee surgeries in three years, so I was medically retired ah. from football. Jeez, get it so out of the I, way. I gave up my scholarship, and I moved down to Lansing and got a job there at uh, uh, WVIC. It was a top 40 station. Well, that's that's interesting experience. Did you want to desperately be in rock, but you just took the job because you had to take a job? 100%. And by the way, you got to remember, this is 1972. Things were still pretty new. Radio was transitioning. AM was still king. FM was just That's kind of right. an upstart new uh, AOR format, as it's called, album-oriented rock. But it was so much cooler then. Oh, my God, was it well, cool. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, you should have heard me uh, ramping up those top 40 songs. <laughs> but I had the, the greatest shift in the world. The shift was noon to three. I'd be on the air from noon till 1230. Then they did a half hour newscast. So I'd go across the street to the Arboretum, have a sandwich, smoke a joint and come back and do my last two hours. <laughs> That's a good gig. It I was a great gig. Do you remember what it paid? Uh, you know what? It was north of ten grand a year. I know that because that's why I took it. It uh, made up for my scholarship, and I took classes at MSU. The problem was there were eight of us doing three-hour shifts, so that didn't last very long. And since I was the new guy in, I was the first guy out. Oh boy. Okay, so then you continued at the campus station, or where? Where did you? How did no, you... Uh, from there I went to uh, WILS in Lansing, and and then. Uh, that was another top 40 station, but I talked the guy into giving me the FM station to myself. And me and another guy, I did uh, 6 p.m. to midnight, and he did midnight to 6. Huh. And was that wow. was the FM rock? Yeah, it was a kind of my design of a format. Oh, that cool. I stole from Riff and W4 and <laughs> WABX. It was the Jim Johnson amalgamation of all of those Detroit stations. <laughs> I know, and nobody could ever do this now. It probably no. sounded better than a lot of rock stations now do, but nobody could ever do that or even be allowed to try it. So, Correct. So did, did, was somebody impressed with your uh, your amalgamation? Uh, not necessarily. No, it was especially the people that I worked for. They thought it was uh, way out there and it was a waste of time. But And what? by the way, I will say this about Lansing. I love going to school there. I love the campus. But... The people there tend to strive for mediocrity. They didn't want to be successful. They didn't want to put the effort in to be more successful. And I was young and gung ho. I wanted to take over the world. So I left there and went in search of a job in Detroit where I really wanted to work at W4 and ended up uh, being fortunate enough to get it. I started there in the summer of 75 and I worked all summer as a weekend guy and did all the vacation shifts. And then in the fall, I started full time doing mornings when mornings meant nothing in FM radio. Mornings were like the all-night shift. <laughs> no, I know. It's so funny. Uh, I remember, you know, AMs that were as FM, like, oh, God, who cares about the FM? Nobody listens to FM. And it was like, what? The stere yeah. stereo FM? And I remember I worked for a guy in, on an AM station in Roanoke, Virginia, and somebody informed me that, yeah, he used to own K92, and he sold it for like 800 bucks or something because nobody thought FM would ever be anything. And I was like, what? Yep. 100%. Oh, my God. So, so, w, so W4, you did mornings there, and that's where you honed your craft? Well, kind of, because uh, I did only did that for a short while, and then Ken Calvert hung up his uh, ah. his uh, record uh, uh, rep job. He was uh, working for Columbia Records, decided to come back and do radio. So he did mornings, I did middays, and then I became the program director of the joint. It was a very funny story. Um, so Jerry Lubin, if you know that name, a historic yeah, name, Detroit sure. Radio, uh, he was the program director. And our general manager, Bart Walsh, came up one day, and there was a note scrawled on a photocopied piece of paper. And there were three stations at the bottom of the page underlined, and it said, Jerry, these are the stations you beat. And it was like, you know, Ann Arbor someplace, maybe Port Huron. Uh -oh. And, you know, a gospel station here in Detroit. Those were the only stations we beat. <laughs> so he got fired and uh, he came to us and he said, he came to Mark Eddy, Steve Dahl, who was doing mornings at oh, that time. Oh, yeah. Steve Dahl was there. And, and myself. And he said, take the weekend write an essay about why you should be program director. <laughs> and I need it on my desk Monday morning. So I did, and I won the essay contest. All right. <laughs> so when did you hire Doug Podell? Because he was telling me today that it was somewhere in the middle of that. And like yeah, 1976. Yeah, it was close to the middle of all. I don't yeah. remember what year exactly it was. 76, it he said. 77-ish, maybe, I'm thinking. Right. That, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Now, what what kind of a fire plug was Doug Podell at that time? I can't imagine him <laughs> was, being in his twenties. He's so crazy. I mean, he's just got so much energy. He, well, he told he me he, he was working he, two jobs at the time. He was working in Flint, and then he was working somewhere in Detroit. Yep. And then you called and uh, said, "This is Jim Johnson," and he goes, uh, "All right," and hung up on you. <laughs> Do you remember That's that? That's probably true. <laughs> 
And then, but, um, to be fair, you guys, uh, those were heady days in our business, and I don't remember a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so was Doug a lot like he is now, only just very, very young? Yes, 100%. Yeah. It all sounded different. I went back recently and listened to some crazy tapes, especially some video of when I did uh, entertainment stuff for Channel 7. And, man, did we talk different, sounded different. Everything was different. <laughs> yeah, you should play some of those tapes uh, your last week at uh, yeah, OMC. Yeah, we probably will. We uploaded one of them to our Facebook page yesterday. We'll probably keep doing that. I got a bunch of them. Pretty people, embarrassing. People wearing, love that stuff. I'm doing, a, I'm doing a piece on punk rock, and I'm walking up and down um, – <laughs> <laughs> uh, like John R. in Hamtramck, and I'm wearing a sleeveless shirt with my guns out. TV. <laughs> I don't know oh God, how Florida who yeah. laid my clothes out for me that day, but it was a mistake. Um, so, how did the programming go? Did did you uh, did you make some improvements over beating just the three stations? Yeah, well, we, uh, we <laughs> I got very very lucky because as I got hired, we also hired a consultant, which we'd never had. His name is Lee Abrams. Huh. And I don't know if you know anything about Lee Abrams. He's the one that put WXYZ FM or Riff on the air the very first time. I think he was 16 years old when he did it. Really? And he became uh, one of the one of the great famous radio consultants in history yeah. back in the uh, early to mid 70s. And he became our consultant. He came to town. He and I, um, got together and we just plugged his format in. It was his cookie cutter, album oriented rock, kind of playing the hits format. So I mean, was your when I was program director, Drew, I was playing everything from Joan Armitrading to uh, <laughs> fusion jazz. Uh, it was an unbelievable format, along with the Stones and the and Led Zeppelin and all of that. Jimmy Hendrix. So did Lee take your freedom away? Was I didn't end? care. We were successful. We went from last to first overnight. Oh, really? Literally overnight wow. with no budget. We had absolutely zero budget. But you, you also had Steve Dahl, who would go on to become one of the really great. I grew up listening to Steve Dahl when he was working, working with uh, Gary Meyer. Well, before he was with Gary Meyer, and then when he was with Gary Meyer, too, on uh, Loop in Chicago yeah. and on DAI and a couple other frequencies. And he was, uh, he was phenomenal. He was very ahead of his time. And I, I, I want to say, did Steve Dahl, his style, did it, did, that preceded Howard Stern, didn't it? Because you, you know both. Absolutely did. Uh, That's when, what Howard I Stern, when Howard Stern was here, first of all, I not only hired Steve Dahl, I had to fire him. <laughs> <laughs> really? What? Yeah, he was working with who became my partner, George Beyer, who did the variety of characters on our oh, morning yeah. show for all those all years. Right. And he was working with Steve Dahl. He worked in a gas station, would call Steve from the gas station and do <laughs> some bits in the morning. And that led to in-person appearances, which ultimately led to a job, and he left the gas station business and became a radio guy. Wow. When That's Steve so got the familiar. job in Chicago, there was like several months uh, from the time he got the job till he was supposed to start, and that was fine. Um, we wished him well, and he was going to continue working. But as it got closer to the end, he didn't like the idea that we were thinking about keeping George on as a partner for a new morning show. He said, well, George is my guy. And I'm like, okay, well, are you taking him with you to Chicago? Has he got a gig there? And he says, no, absolutely not. And I said, well, why do you want him to lose his job? Yeah. You know, and, and he did some characters on the morning show that were very popular. So there were little things along the way where he would turn George's microphone off when they went in to do a bit. <laughs> and then a few days uh, before he left, he, he called George and said, hey, George, I want to take the last few days just to say goodbye on my own terms, so I don't need you here. Oh, wow. So nice. I'm at the station on a Sunday night, and George calls me. I called Steve, and I said, Steve, we've had this discussion 10 times already. George is going to be on the new morning show, whatever that may be, and I want some continuity, so George stays. And you put him on the air, you deal with him, okay? And he went and said no, and we went back and forth and back and forth, and I got pissed, and I said, finally... Steve, consider today your last day. Come oh. and get your shit out of here first thing in the morning. Oh, and then you took over. Well, I slept on a couch at the radio station that <laughs> night and uh, did the morning show the next morning. Wow. No, did, are, are you and Dal friends since that happened? I mean, is that all water over um, the bridge? We have mended fences. He, uh, he talked smack on me in Chicago radio for a long time, <laughs> but I didn't care. I thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> and then we met somewhere at a conference or a charity thing or a concert or somewhere 
years ago and kind of mended fences about all of that. You know, he talked smack about everyone in radio. And I got to tell you, listening to that as, as I was growing up and getting interested in radio, I was always fascinated by that. And yet everyone always said, don't ever talk about radio. Don't talk about inside radio. Don't go about program directors. And, right. and I had heard, having listened to Steve Dahl and how entertaining he was talking about that stuff, I knew that was bullshit. Yes, 100%. <laughs> But yeah, we all he, figure that out. But you know, talent is a little uh, quicker to the draw than management yes, is. Yes, that's know true. <laughs> yeah, I would have to agree. So, so then W four that that sounds like it was uh, just going along swimmingly. Uh, did WRIF lure you away from W four? Yeah. So uh, here's what happened. They ch sort of changed ownership, um, and uh, I was doing mornings and a program director for a year. I told our our GM that. I'll give you one year of doing both jobs. And at the end of that year, I was so burned out. Um, I went and said, look, either uh, uh, he said, do you have a choice? You can do the program director job or the morning show job. And I said, I'm done with programming. I said, I'm doing the morning show and I'm getting out of here at 10 o'clock in the morning. Huh. And he said he read me the riot act, said I was making the biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> that management was where it was at. And I'm like, eh. <laughs> I, I mean, it was either do the morning show or quit entirely and go sell shoes at Nordstrom. Was, was there money in morning radio then? No, not really. It started getting better when we went to Riff because they sort of lured us away. They knew we were kind of unhappy with the ownership change, and uh, we were ready to move on up. And they were the big dog at the time, right? That's ABC owned. Sure. Channel 7, the whole nine yards. So it was pretty attractive, and the money started getting better then. And actually, uh, you had to resign at Rift too, so it probably got better and, and better. Better and better, yeah. <laughs> and then Wheels came along and lured us away with even more money from Rift. Was that was then, was that the was that as far as uh, the ability to bargaining power? Was the Wheels move? Was that the was that the peak for you? Yes. And yes. did uh, did did you hundred percent? Because as you know, back in those days, radio was so undervalued. I'll give you an example. As program director at W4, I had to do the budget, which I had no idea even what the concept of it was, right? <laughs> but I had to do a budget for my department. And at the end of the day, when my budget was done and we all sat down for the budget meeting, I realized our radio station, that one single radio station, was making more than 42% profit. No company makes that kind of profit. Wow. Wow. Huh. Um, and, was, was, and investment bankers figured that out very quickly and started buying up radio stations left and right. Uh, and to make it work, they would try to lure, you know, the popular talent away and pay them big money. Absolutely. That's how it should work. And then uh, yes. hopefully the advertising works. The advertisers get great results and you're good commerce. And then um, it all it all works. It's a great circle when it works that way. Yeah, Unfortunately, and so every happened. station is owned by two companies, and then there's <laughs> yeah. nobody to negotiate with anymore. <laughs> exactly. But what I was wondering is when uh, when you got lured to WLZ from WRIF, and you were in a great position then because Riff was really starting to become a big deal, and it was an ABC station and all that. Did did you consider you know Chicago like Steve Dahl or New York or LA, or were you just pretty married to Detroit? Pretty married to Detroit. I got to say, it's my hometown, Drew, and I mean that's one of the things. It's been sort of golden handcuffs. I haven't had a chance to live anywhere else in the world. But on the other hand, how many people in our business get to hone their craft for 52 years in their hometown? No, I, you know, I never even considered it. And I, I never really had a great chance to go to Chicago. I had a chance once, but it was in the middle of a contract. And I always kind of freaked out about the idea of working in my hometown. It's like, I don't want to fail in my hometown. <laughs> and yeah. Chicago was so big to me. Yeah. Although, yeah. honestly, when I came to Detroit, Detroit was like, I want to say it was market five or six, or it was big six. in 1991. It was a huge market. It still is a huge market. But I think we it had was an offer during that our second contract negotiation with Wheels, uh, an offer to go to Chicago, and it was for some pretty good money, um, but uh, not enough to make us move. We were doing just fine; it didn't want to take the chance. You know, that's that's kind of how I think I looked at it. Once once you get ensconced, and I mean, Detroit really will. Once you get over here, it's a great thing because it seems like people will not let you go. Um, but but through all that success at, at WRF and Wheels and then on to CSX, somehow George retires how many years before you? 20 years or something? Yeah, so he was 40 years old when he retired. <laughs> how, how did he do that? Well, uh, you know, this is really kind of getting deep into the weeds, but you'll probably appreciate it, Drew. 
uh, and, and, and all you guys will. Yeah. You know, I sort of uh, felt like after so many years, our, our, uh, the concept of our show sort of played itself out. You know, everything's got a life expectancy, a shelf life, right? You mean characters? Yes. Yeah, sure. So I get it. I kind of pushed for more and more uh, human interaction as opposed to just me and a bunch of fake characters. And so we added, uh, you know, uh, our news person was Lynn Woodison. She got more involved in the show. Um, and their concept, you remember Tom Bender, you worked for him sure. for a while. Um, his idea and Fred Jacobs at the time was they thought more was better. So they actually went out and hired Ed Kelly yeah. to add even more characters <laughs> to the show. Well, that kind of pissed George off. He saw the kind of handwriting oh. on the wall, and that's when he uh, kind of made his decision, I'm going to ease out of here early. But oh. he never spent a penny in his life, not one. <laughs> <laughs> if we, he honestly still has his first communion money to this day. So did George ever work another job after that? Me uh, dabbled a little bit. Uh, he moved immediately moved to up north near Charlevoix, uh, built a house on a little lake up there, not Lake Charlevoix, but a little lake nearby. And uh, he dabbled around doing stuff. I think he was a bus driver. I think he uh, <laughs> was a special ed mentor for his kid's school. Um, and uh, he I don't know if he ever did it, but his initial plan was to form a, a, a snow removal company called Plowed by Noon. <laughs> and I thought that was a brilliant name for a snowplow company. <laughs> but it sounds like he didn't have to work that much. Uh, no, because he, first of all, was Saved very frugal. Money. I'll give you an example. We go out to dive bars to, for whatever reason, and uh, we'd order something to eat and uh, maybe a pitcher of beer for two bucks. And if I had four more ounces of that beer, I was paying four more ounces of the cost of it when we split the bill. <laughs> well, that's maybe that's why he was able to retire so early. Yes, and, exactly. Um, and why I had to wait till I'm 112. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this seems like a good time to uh, to retire. I, I, You know, actually, I was going to say at OMC, have you, did you reach number one, 25 to 54 at OMC? In the middays, not mornings. Okay. But I did I didn't do mornings there um, until recently. Yeah, I just remember reading that you were number one, and I guess it must have been middays, but I thought, wow, that's, I mean, that's yeah, really cool. They make that shit up, too. You know that, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, those crazy rating books, and uh, I, I don't know. Well, you in the demo, though, I mean, OMC was doing very well, so it didn't surprise me. We did great. Yeah, middays, we were, we were rock and roll in the middays. It was great, because it was, you know what, a, a format like that is accessible to everybody. Even you go back to CSX, and they were more of a classic rock station. Yeah. The differentiation with OMC is a classic hits station. So we were playing Motown records and Lionel Richie, R&B stuff, along with rock records. But they were all top 40 hits. They were all, if it wasn't a top 10 record, we didn't play it. Where um, at the other rock stations, you get album cuts. We didn't have that. Jim, do you have any feelings about... Um well, first of all, I, I've been out of radio for eight years, and I just wondered, does it feel different than it felt eight years ago? Because I know a lot of QM, which is the total listenership, has dropped off. Uh, it, it's it's coming back a little bit, though. We were, it, uh, in, in my heyday there several years ago, we, were, we had a million uh, QM, which was huge. It was number one in the market. It fell back a little bit, especially with the pandemic nonsense. And um, but it uh, last time I checked, it was about eight fifty or something like that. So it's up there again. Yeah, that's it's still back. that's still a lot of bodies. Uh, do you? I mean, if somebody said, Jim, how can we save radio? How can we somehow get it close to where it used to be, or somehow get it going in the right direction? It seems like it's just going down, down, down. And there's you know, television's going through the same thing. What do you think radio needs to do? Uh, well, I mean, I think uh, they needed to embrace the product throughout all these years, and it may be too late because they didn't. As yeah. we talked about earlier, uh, investment bankers saw the you know 40% profit margin and decided, holy cow, that's a business we need to buy. And so they buy them and buy them and buy them and sell them and buy them and sell them and then collect them. And then you get two or three companies that own all the stations, and they're an investment bank. They're out there to please their advertisers or their uh, shareholders, and they don't really care about the product. They could be making you know pillowcases, uh, and it wouldn't matter. 
Yeah, that was the, the death knell. Was it used to be you could have seven AMs, seven FMs, maybe one TV station, one newspaper, and that was it. You couldn't own yeah. any more than that. And once yeah. it became so that, and I remember that crazy moment when deregulation started. And for example, CSX, which was Greater Media, you bought us at WRIF, and yes. I, I remember being terrified about going into the building because you guys were already in the building. I was like, Oh my God, that's a competition. How can we be in the same building with those well, guys? That's crazy. Okay. It was all counterintuitive because our whole mission every day was to beat each other's brains out <laughs> exactly and steal guests <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it was really it was really awkward and i was you know i was like oh i it's gonna be so weird will we ever feel you know at home and in the station with uh, you know these competitors <laughs> it just yeah, seemed just... crazy to me <sighs> yeah. um but i worked for places where the owner was actually in the building and only oh, owned yeah. one station Hundred percent, yeah. And the owner would usually be standing at the front door about five o'clock with his mm. hand out, collecting <laughs> orders from his salespeople. <laughs> yeah, but there, I tell you what, fixing things was a lot more desperate at that station. And you would try certain things, you would try different things, and they would play with the music. They would not, you know, necessarily go by what a consultant said necessarily, because it was all on us, and it was all on him. He owned the thing. So, you know, when you yeah. had a bad book, you had to do something about it. Yep. But now it just seems like I, I, it's all different. And and here's the thing, what they've done. The other thing, the other problem is, and, and I could be proven wrong on this, and maybe in the long run I will, but um, they have embraced digital technology to the exception of radio. Radio is more of an afterthought with these companies, even though radio is still the cash cow for these companies. Uh-huh. They think the future is all going to be digital media, uh, medium and uh, and audio only of any kind of audio, whether it's radio or podcasting or whatever, and that that's the future. The problem is nobody's really been able to figure out how to monetize it to the same degree. No, you're right. But I feel at the same time that radio has forgotten what is so great because there's nothing better than being live and the ability to deliver information right now, be local and live. And I feel like there's such a failure in that respect. Nobody is really emphasizing that like, oh, my God, uh, you know, Steve Eiserman was just named general manager. Let's put the press conference on the air or, you know, whatever, yeah. something not, like not, that. Not to mention smaller markets and rural markets and how important it is there, you know, where maybe, they, yeah. maybe they don't have the Internet. Right, yeah, it's good internet. Uh, yeah. And they, you they, know, I still feel like we're doing that every day, Drew, and it's fun. It's been, you know, honestly, the last three and a half years that I've been doing this have been the most fun that I've had. First of all, I get to work from home. I have not gone back to the station. Oh, really? Am I, am I going to? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Well, I work at home too, so I know how you feel, and it has been <laughs> yeah. a lot of fun. Well, what happened was the first day of our show was March sixteenth of nineteen or eighteen, whenever the pandemic started. Oh, <laughs> we got a call that weekend. We were all set. We went into the station the Friday before that, had pictures taken, and then we were getting our first show together for Monday. We get a call on Saturday saying, there's a lockdown. The state is closed. You have to stay home and do your show. So Joanne Purton came over to my condo in Auburn Hills, and we did the show together from here, day one. First day of the JJ and uh, Joanne oh, show. Oh, wow. That's bizarre. Then... That day at 10 o'clock, we get a call from the company saying, no, you can't be in the same place together. Joanne's <laughs> got to be at her house. you got to be here. And it's been that way ever since for three and a half years. That's kind of strange not being in the same room all the time. But I guess you just get used to it. Well, I got this giant Mac desktop screen in front of me. And the entire screen is my face Joanne's face and Jason's face. So I'm actually looking at them more closely than if I would be if I was <laughs> in the same true. room with them. You don't yeah. see their body and their body language. Uh, a little bit you do. It's, yeah. it, it's, we found it's, a way to make it work. It can work. Uh, so, Trudy, who is, uh, who is going to replace JJ? I, well, that's a good question. Who is? He's irreplaceable, no Trudy. That's the answer. <laughs> and by the way, you guys know enough how this works. Once, once that... Uh, I made the announcement that I was leaving. I don't get any intelligence information any longer. I get none of that. <laughs> but you can guess. Uh, no, I honestly can't. I, I, I will guess that um, Joanne and Jason will stay. Whether or not they add another person to the show, I have no idea. Yeah, well, the show's doing well. Why would they? You don't. You want to keep what's working there, and then find that that third person that will fit in with them. I would assume. 
I'm sure that's what they're thinking, Drew. But again, I, I haven't even had the conversation with them because it, you just you just know it's not really any of my business anymore. Yeah, that's true. Why should you care? <laughs> Uh, well, I, it's not that I don't care, but it's why should they be interested in what I think? Yeah. I'm leaving. No, I get it. So, Trudy, you, can you think of anybody that would? Uh, um, is there somebody in their company that they would move, like from afternoons at well, one of their other stations, or? Um, who used to do? Oh man. Um, I, no, I can't. I can't think of anybody off the top of my head. But but um, maybe it's time to bring back George. You know, George Bayer? <laughs> Maybe George. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. He costs too much. <laughs> Was has George done any podcasting or anything like that? Nope. No. Well, really? I mean, you know, we we've done a couple together uh, for other people's podcasts. But sure. Not oh, cool. Um, yeah. would you are you interested in doing a podcast? Perhaps. I again, I have I, I haven't really looked that far down the road. As I said, I'm gonna. Take the first three months of next year and sort of plot out the next move. I don't know. Well, you're, well, no. you're still going to be available for Let It Rip, though, right? Yes. Uh, right. Well, and I haven't been available for Let It Rip for the last three and a half years because when I went back to doing mornings, they oh. thought that oh, they there was it. too much uh, too much scrutiny of my political oh. activity oh. and would reflect poorly on the radio station. And they're probably right. <laughs> That's weak, though. Wow, that's uh, that's interesting. So you you've really been staying away from politics on the show, pretty much, and even on Facebook for the most part. I, and or I will say I've certainly toned it down. But you know that's the other happy coincidence about leaving when I'm leaving. I got an election year in front of me. Oh yeah. yeah. Now what so, is it, what is that going to mean for you when you're retired? Well, I would still be. Uh, uh, politically active on social media as much as I can, and I'm sure I'll be uh, back on Let It Rip on uh, more of a regular yeah. basis as well. Oh yeah, Not sure. That it's that impactful, but it does. It's a place to vent my frustration and get my message out. Yeah, that's that's one of the things I, I think you would miss the most is not having a way to sort of get it out because it's a really unique thing to be able to have strong feelings about something, whether it's politics or sports or music, and to have this this position where you got a microphone to a lot of people and you get to get your feelings out, and to not have that would be, uh, I, I think, it'd be very hard. It'd be frustrating, but I'm, uh, there'll be avenues for me to participate. Sure. No doubt. Um, I just thought of the oh, person who, who could step in, Jim Harper. <laughs> oh, man. Well, Jim Harper, is, okay. he, is he interested in working these days? I don't know. You Somebody gotta, suggested you guys, him. He, you was, gotta, he was in the lottery. The it's a young person's uh, world out there, you guys. Um, our, our, we're looking to attract 40-year-old uh, adults leaning more towards women. 40-year-old women don't want old guys like me and Jim Harper. Well, they were doing okay. I mean, you got as long as you have Joanne there, I, I, I think there's something to be said for that. I mean, I certainly wish that the people running for president were younger. <laughs> I, yeah, will say that. I can't fucking believe that's going to happen. But um, you know what? Yeah. I, want, I want to ask you something. Because you had George and you had Ed Kelly. Was, did you have a favorite character that made you laugh the most? Well, it had to be the bruiser. I mean, he was sort of the, he was sort of the number two uh in command of the show. He's the one that did everything. He's the one that did, uh, by and large, most of the parody th songs that were successful along the way. Um, he was a big, he was the the biggest focus on the show. So it would have to be the Dick the Bruiser character. No, but I mean, you they know were all creative. Sid Abel was a genius character. Yes, very funny. I heard Sid Abel. Coleman absolutely. Young was a magnificent yeah. character. He was really good. He really was. Very talented guy. Um, as far as uh, George being George, though, could George be George? We tried that for a while. It didn't seem to ignite anything. But as I said, I mean, those were kind of the days where I think J.J. and the morning crew was transitioning towards something a little different. Yeah. Huh. No, I get it. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm happy for you because I know you're you're going to look forward to it. It's going to be really weird. I, it, it just seems so strange. Every time somebody retires, I feel bad about it because I'm like, wait, if he's quitting, that means that I, it's closer to me quitting, <laughs> and I don't really want to quit yet. It just it's just hard to think of the end. Did, was that hard? To, did you struggle to come up with a date? Of and actually, yeah, and I'm still struggling with it a little bit. As I said, I'm I'm scared to death. I don't know anything else. I don't know anything different. I've never done anything different in my life. I mean. I was a kid, uh, you know, 11 and 12 years old with a little pocket transistor radio under my covers in bed at night. 
uh, listening to CKLW, and uh, every once in a while, WLS signal would come in from Chicago and Keener 13, and I, I had a dream that one day I'd be able to do something like that, and it kind of worked out. Well, congratulations uh, on a phenomenal career right here in Detroit. And uh, oh, by the way, if you went into the Hall of Fame, which uh, which uh, station's hat would you wear? <laughs> oh boy. Well, that's a great. What jersey would I wear, huh? Probably have to be. It would have to be Riff, I think. Yeah, that's what I thought you'd say. Uh, but you know, hey, that was know. that was really the heyday. Although I was at CSX much longer, and I've been here at OMC much longer. Riff was really the heyday, and that's where it all sort of the magic really happened. Yeah, no, I know. I heard a lot of stories over the years, and, and a lot of those parody songs. And I saw you guys. Uh, actually, you and George were both on Riff during the 50th anniversary, weren't you? Yes, we were, and that was yeah, a blast. That was fun. It was fun to listen to. Well, yeah. congratulations again, JJ. I'm sure we'll uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll talk again soon, and I'll probably see you at Killer Cares in December. You will for sure, and I uh, really appreciate you having me on. Nice to see all you guys, and uh, stay in touch. Happy to do this whenever you want. And look, right. what, look what we found. We found that uh, that handsome young Sweet. man. Yeah, that's that's the one <laughs> that's I was video. telling you about. Yep. What was I thinking? <laughs> what in God's name was I thinking? You look pretty <laughs> sweet. There it is. You look a little uh, Ditka-esque, maybe, with the glasses. You're so a punk. little it's... bit Miami Vice dish. <laughs> it's, it's it's so punk rock. My it's, God. It's, sun's it's, out. Sun's it's out. Technically, it was new wave, is what you were covering. Which okay. Makes, to me even more hilarious that's yeah. really funny yeah wow <laughs> we're gonna play there's that video of, back there's a lot of embarrassing shots like that here i'll show you another one. Oh, oh great. Did, did you guys when you were at riff did you ever uh like rummage through the closet and find <laughs> yeah three thousand boxes of what was called the riff concert guide because we ordered oh. two hundred thousand of them yeah we, we did yeah. we would run into stuff like that and i always had yeah. felt i had to read it i couldn't wait to read stuff like right. that it was just so stupid oh wow. you, uh, remember the center fold look at that <laughs> my goodness so, yeah. short shorts <laughs> short tight white wow, shorts Trudy, don't look, look at that he is yeah <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of shit i'm running across yeah. that we're gonna have fun with that uh, guy's giving this guy a run for his money right there <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> back to the the new wave shot yeah well have a great night jim have a great retirement and we'll see you soon all right, thank you guys very much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Great you. talking to you. All right, God, I and love those old Mark, stories. Mark, we have uh, Jim's story. Yeah, the new yep. wave story. Okay, great. I want to watch that in a minute. But uh, I see so this. it's in the middle of Good Afternoon Detroit, and they're doing a second back it up to. Oh, okay, yeah, because he did. He was on Good Afternoon Detroit quite a bit. Yeah, and sometimes Kelly and Company. I yeah, guess, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't Seven picture days. that. And when Boy George unleashed his gender <laughs> transcendency on the world, <laughs> New Wave had arrived. All right. You might think Detroit's the last place to find the avant-garde. <laughs> Not as Certainly so. White There's an pants? entire community of New Wave, both full and part-time, that can rival any in New York, Los Angeles, or London. I'm originally from Grosse Point, and it's, like, very conservative and sort of quiet, you know? <laughs> 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 so he's doing he's the interview with the tank top on. <laughs> I've been dressing this he's way got the skinny since tie. I was in high school, and I, I used to wear things like yellow satin jeans in those days. <laughs> and... He looks more new wave than George or Jim class. by a mile. Oh yeah, yeah. Into the guy being interviewed. New wave yes. reveals who they are, where they work and play, and how they achieve the look. Liedernacht, where Sterling reigns nightly. <laughs> Maybe is that where was they the point. He wanted see. to look as NBC. less new wave as possible. Oh, there's some way wavers. Walking in the door of Liedernacht, sort of like fantasy world. It's very dark and it's purple. Oh, hazy. where's that club now? Black lit. Oh, it gets probably new yeah. Gilbert Building. Eclectic and vibrant. Hey, you could smoke inside. Bartenders look just whacked out, you know. <laughs> very visual, you know, even though it's dark, it's very visual and very sort of seedy and evoking uh, I love dark corners and stuff. <laughs> so Is this Trek Volte's dad or something? What are they dancing to? Yeah. Yeah. Piper used to be a dental assistant. Do my hair out, go out to the bars, come home in the morning, get barely any sleep, have to put it down, wash it, be normal, put on a uniform, all white, and go to work. You know? And now I can just be like this 24 hours a day like I'd like to. I'm worried about these kids, kids this youth. Responsible position in her father's very traditional ad agency. Wow. <laughs> Zoe, that's the same girl. Yes. The one we want. Okay, that's good. But she's not new wave yeah, there. The game. You have to be corporate or otherwise. Yeah, you're part of the man now. I want to respect you. 
That looks like Detroiters, doesn't it? Detroiters <laughs> <laughs> just got the sauce. The office looks like Detroiters. It looks just like Tim Robinson's office in the Detroiters. Her dad concurs. Wow. The clothes that she wears at work still are, uh, let's say, acceptable to our clients. <laughs> the hairstyle is, uh, <laughs> yes, it's, it's it could hilarious. be looked upon as a little uh, far out, but uh, far out. it doesn't affect her performance. This is today's lifestyle. Oh, look at his hair. I love his hair. His hair's great. You should try and influence it with old-fashioned ideas. Oh, he's so open-minded. Chops yeah. like Tobacco Road he's can pretty be cool. a haven for new waivers. Clothes were a very big part of my life. I've always wanted to get into design. I don't think there's a limit to the sides there are of me. I'm always exploring. So deep. And she is I know that so I can deep. be whoever I want. New waivers line up for the outrageous creations of Shyla. I think they want the freedom Shyla. to be individuals, to look like what they want to look Shyla like. Shyla, the hairstylist. Just do their thing. Oh, it's making Gen X sound a lot like scary. Gen Z. But on the other hand, that's what they want to accomplish, and that's what they want to look like. So <laughs> look you at do that it. salon. <laughs> it's the 70s. At Down River's hungry brain, the burned out and restless are another Boy, they gave Jim a lot of time on this story, didn't they? The, the burned out and restless. <laughs> Hard edge manifestation of new wave of sound. Okay, what is that sound? Loosely referred to as a skinhead scene. I know what it is. It's terrible. The asylum is Mecca for still another group, trendies from the affluent <laughs> suburbs. <laughs> Here, the whirling, bouncing new wavers gyrate to a happier rhythm at the rich and famous. <laughs> They're gyrating. Rapping, brilliant and rich brocades, there's not the slightest pretense. They're not wearing costumes. <laughs> That song doesn't sound very new wave to me. They may have the answer. Well, these are the trendies. I don't know. Maybe it's a different uh, clothes yeah. and I style of new I think wave. it is. I'm very chameleon like. I can. He's chameleon like. It's Cunanan. <laughs> when you call the card, I These can people are all so deep. And the music is so bad. Yeah. Wow. It's awful. Boy, do I feel out of it. Uh, <laughs> we'll be right back with a look at what suits? our new wave We'll come back to Jim out of that, right man. There. Yeah, where's Jim? I want to see that like, sleeveless shirt one more time. It would have been great if he ended the piece dressed as a total new waiver, like in a makeover <laughs> in the middle of the piece. Yeah, his hair would be a couple different colors. Now, you know, I remember at WVT when... I got to school in the fall of 77, and New Wave, disco was still it. Yeah. Everything was disco. Donna Summer and all that. But around 78, that London music was coming over, the second British invasion. Uh -huh. And once I found Elvis Costello, it was like, oh, my God. I, this is it. All of yeah, this well, stuff well, sucks. Yeah, punk, even, too. Yeah, we had punk, too, yeah. uh, because the Clash and the yeah. Sex Pistols and all that was coming. And, and there was a very distinct division, especially at WVT. You were a punker or you were a new waver, and I was absolutely <laughs> a new waver. I had skinny ties, I did. Mm. Yeah, and you were Drew Wave. <laughs> yeah, it was Drew Wave at WVVV. So, which was, now that's a pretty good name, I got to admit, yeah. for, for, for a new waver. Yeah. But, but it was funny, I just remember people asking, like, so is that chick a new waver or is she punk or what? I can't tell. Uh. And, oh, she's a new waver all the way, man. And it's like, oh, that's cool. And I remember we didn't really like punk chicks because they, they were just too unpredictable and weird and, you know, safety pins in the ears and stuff. And it's like, oh, those punk chicks are kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> but there was very much a division between the new wavers and the punkers. And they would block program the station. So you might have punk from... 12 to 4, and then New Wave from 4 to Midnight. Wow. And you might have Classic Rock in there, too. And Classic Rock at that time was Pink Floyd. Right. The same thing it is now. Yeah. Pink Floyd, The Beatles, The well, Stones. It was Classic Rock then. It was just rock. Yeah, but we, we called it Classic. Really? We, I think we called it Classic Rock then, or maybe we did just call it Rock. But Rock had a lot of places. But you know what nobody would play on that station was Van Halen, ACDC. Any of the corporate rock of the day was out. If you like Van Halen, like get the fuck out of here. We don't play. We don't play Van Halen on UVT. Hmm. Know, corporate rock I thought of was Journey and Foreigner. It wasn't and trendy. Ario Speedwagon. It wasn't cool. Oh, Ario Speedwagon. We would never play Ario Speedwagon at WVT. <laughs> no way. It was Flock of Seagulls. Um, oh, actually, they hadn't come along yet. Who was around? I'll stop the world and melt with you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that kind of stuff. And I remember, English. you know, REM had that EP in 82, and I was still working at UVT then, even though I wasn't in school. And, uh, and REM played the disco in Blacksburg after sundown. And, I, and there's, a, there's a Facebook page for, like, 
who's been to R- who went to REM on March 6, 1982 or whatever. And there's all these people talking about it because it was, it was such a big deal at the time. Uh-huh. And uh, and but but when REM, of course, started having hits, that's when everybody hated them. Like, oh, my God, they got a hit record. <laughs> Fuck R.E.M. <laughs> I know. That was Everybody a likes them now. That was a thing. <laughs> but those first few R.E.M. albums are fantastic, and they never got airplay. Oh. Those first few records, like Radio, um, Murmur with Radio Free Europe. Oh. I don't think, did Radio play Radio Free Europe? It or seems Boxcar to me that played or that at stuff? least one. I don't remember. Yeah, I, I remember Radio Free Europe getting played, but... Oh, um, you know me what? in the mood for some REM, man. So, um, and you too. Oh, you sorry, too. Those was... were crazy times. <laughs> we used to give each other wet willies and funny arms. We played dandy balls and legs are spread and penis butt. <laughs> we played. Uh, 